Welcome to Inner Compass. I'm Shirley Hoekstra. Today's guest was imprisoned as a child during the Khmer Rouge takeover of Cambodia. She barely escaped with her life and her parents did not. After making her way to the U.S. and becoming a lawyer, she turned her eye back to Cambodia to help rebuild a country still recovering. Join us today on Inner Compass. From the campus of Calvin College, this is Inner Compass, exploring how people use faith and ethics to guide them through critical issues of today. My guest today is Thierry Sang, author of Daughter of the Killing Fields, soon to be published in the U.S. under another title. And it is about her tragic experiences in Cambodia during and after the Khmer Rouge genocide of 1975 to 79. Welcome, Thierry. Thank you, it's great to be here. So in 1975, the Khmer Rouge take over the standing government in Cambodia, and they order all the people out of Phnom Penh because they say the U.S. is gonna be bombing the city. Why was that believable? Uh, Cambodia is situated in mainland Southeast Asia. It was the stage of the Cold War politics. Um, the Viet and Vietnam War is raging next door. Um, the Vietnamese soldiers had entered Cambodian land. There were bombings. There were already secret U.S. bombings under President Nixon. So it was very believable. Oh, but of course, it was a pretext. Um, right. It was a pretext to to literally empty the capital city of three million people. They and I was living there with my relatives, with my family as a four-year-old, um, and they succeeded. Uh, and of course, in the midst of the confusion, um, it's, it's, and in the midst of warfare, who knows what is right or what is wrong, what is believable, what is fact, what is myth. Um, so they were the new authority. We listened to them. Um, plus, they were violent, so we, we had no choice but to listen. And they said and your lives were going to be in danger. And, and they said that our lives were going to be endangered. They told us not to take much. Mm. Um, of course, you know, we took the valuables uh, and food stuff for two or three days. Um, but the whole, they, they, they succe uh, successfully emptied a whole capital of three million people. So for the next four years, the reign of the Khmer Rouge, here is a country with its capital emptied of residents. And all the residents uh, are now slaving um, in labor camps across the whole country. They wanted to return Cambodia to this agricultural, agrarian society. Mm. And so your family was an educated family. Your father had been in the uh, armed services yeah. for Lan Nol. Yeah. Um, and they had invited, the Khmer Rouge invited everybody to come back who was an official, but that was a pretense. It was, it was a pretense. It was a pretext to get rid of the civil servants, the soldiers of the prior regime, their enemy. Um, and my father answered the call. So in April 1975, as we're journeying, um, I'm exiting the, the city with to three million other people, um, they they called all the other servants, civil servants back the, of the former regime, um, and they returned and disappeared. The euphemism for murdered. And your family didn't know that your father had been murdered. He just didn't come back to the place that you were going to be waiting for him. It was confirmed later on by um, a Khmer Rouge soldier who had infiltrated um, my father's battalion, who knew my mother well. So basically, I mean, the Khmer Rouge wanted, as you mentioned, to return the country to the year zero, um, to and and elevated the peasant the peasantry. Um, and during that time, there was a very, it was a class warfare, really. Um, there was a, a, a very distinct class divide um, of the city or the townspeople um, known to or, or perceived to be tainted with imperialism, uh, the, the hatred for the Western imperialist um, Americans and, and, and the Western cultures by these new leaders, that what we are now and uh, then uh, are now know as the Khmer Rouge, and, and who uh, and they elevated the, uh, the peasants' class. So for me, my, fa my father is of the peasant stock, so we had relatives in the countryside, so they were part of the base people or of the peasantry, which is now elevated. And my mom's family, my maternal relatives, were of the townspeople, were the uh, of um, the Chinese merchant class. Um, and we are now the target um, persecuted group of the 
new people, the townspeople. Um, but we, when we were forced to evacuate the, um, our, um, our home, we, um, we went to live with my other relatives on my, on my um, dad's side in the, in the countryside. And then suddenly, your, yourself, your mother, and your three brothers are imprisoned. Uh, and then lived for the next three, four years um, as slaves of this new regime. Um, Planting then, crops. Um, forced labor in, in, the, in the most extreme um, in conditions, under the most extreme conditions. And then three years later, because we were still tainted by the fact that we were part of the new people we had, and come from towns, um, we were um, imprisoned. We were, initially we, we thought we were taken to be killed that night, um, but um, phew, to our relief, yes. it was only a prison um, sentence of, of five, six months. No um, trial. They no just, trial. No. Um, um, this is this is a uh, uh, very ultra nationalistic, dictatorial, um, radical regime uh, where, um, I mean, everything was abolished. The the court system was abolished. The educational system was abolished. The financial system was abolished. Literally abolishing everything with the goal of returning the country to the year zero. And then, where did they hope to rebuild it into the sort of the image of the Khmer Rouge idea? Of in the image of the, in the image of the peasantry. Mm -hmm. They they it was uh, it was this insane regime who elevated the peasantry, the ignorance of the peasantry, the, um, the, the romanticized idealism of a simple life, um, of trying to cleanse any, um, any influence of the um, outside world, in particular the Western world. But also it allowed them to control the population. If you don't have anybody who is critical mm -hmm. or reading or writing or publishing against the uh, wickedness of such mm -hmm. a regime, they're in more control. They, they were in complete control. And um, the world actually was oblivious, most of the world, or, or didn't really want to, 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 I think was exhausted. I think, first of all, the United States was exhausted by, mainly, um, by Southeast Asia because of the Vietnam War. And so there was no one was going to invade to no save Cambodia. No one's going to invade to save no, in Cambodia. We just lost the Vietnam War. And um, it's it's the, and there's too much association with the region, too much um, too much um, trauma associated with the region. But nor and did Europe. No, nor did Europe. Um, so it was it was the, it was a country for four years closed to the outside world, and in in the blackness of of it all the Khmer Rouge regime went awry and had its own way in killing its own people, had its own way in destroying a culture. Without observation. Without observations. So but this is, this, this is not a surprise. I mean, things happen when there's no observation. Right. Things happen in the dark. That's Evil right. happens because there is no one speaking out. You're in prison with your brothers and your mother, and all of a sudden, one day, your mother is gone. It was all of a sudden and not all of a sudden. I mean, my mom knew, in hindsight, in trying to piece this together, um, my mom knew uh, that night that she was going to be killed. She knew. Um, and she has you and your brother, your youngest brother, right next to her. You yeah. lay side by side, yeah. all three of you, right? Yeah. And we were in this remote um, security center where ultimately 30,000 people were killed here. But that night, they, they took, they separated my three older brothers and took them to a different locale. And so it was just the, the adult prison population, my mom, my youngest brother, and myself. And um, that evening or that night, they, they came as they normally do and shackled all the adults' ankles um, for the night. Um, they had tried to shackle my ankle, but I was seven years old, skin and bone. It could, they, they could slip in and out, what's the point? So my, my job was to bring toilet bucket to the other immobile prisoners in that cabin. All night long? Um, whenever anyone needs me, they would just call and I, I would pick up the, the, and, 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 and bring it to them since they can't reach the toilet bucket. Um, but that night, um, I remember, because I was still awake, um, seeing two or three prison guards came in, and coming back I thought, strange, they've already shackled everyone's ankles. Why are they here again? So I remember catching their eyes, and then they immediately left. But they were carrying wet robes. 
So wet ropes? Wet ropes. The, the oh. wetness is to make it malleable to ah. tie because when it's all dry, it's, you can't get it tightly tied. Um, and I remember turning to my mom, I said, Mom, why were those guards carrying wet robes? Of course she knew, she already knew what, and what is to happen that night. And so she turned to me and she said, my daughter, go back to sleep. Oh. And those were her last words to me. The next thing I knew is waking up the next morning to an empty cell. And immediately my brother and I convulsively cried and cried and cried because it was just a new sensation. Everything in our being told us that Something my changed. mom is no longer on this earth. And um, so what seems like crying for hours, and they try to, you know, and they try to calm us down by lying to us, saying, you know, um, your mom is just working another The cabin. other adults did, or the um, prison guards? Uh, the prison guards, because all the other adults also were killed. Oh. Everyone was killed that night. Everyone was everyone killed Everyone was killed that, that night. And of course, in hindsight, we know this, but everyone was killed that night, except for my youngest brother, and for me, a seven-year-old. Do you, what, what, how do you understand that you were saved? Why not kill the two children? You know, in hindsight, they wanted, the Khmer Rouge soldiers wanted intentionally to preserve the children. And they intentionally wanted, that's why they separated my three older brothers during the day. That's why when they came in the first time and saw I was awake, they went back. To wait till you were asleep? Because this is to wait for, and for me to sleep. Because that, when they came with the wet robes, they had come for the adult prisoners to be taken to be killed. So amidst the pure insanity, amidst yes. pure evil, there was this strand of compassion that they showed to us. It's, and here I am sitting talking And here talking you are sitting. This. You go back to your village and ultimately you go to Thailand yeah. um, where there's a refugee camp and then ultimately to the United States. So imagine this, <laughs> Shirley. Here we are having just survived four years of genocide, yes. lost our parents, children of four, seven, eight, nine, twelve um, of, and the five of us with my, um, my uh, mom's relatives now. And they kind Living, of come to take to be your parents. They, they, yes. they, 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 um, they gave us shelter. And all of a sudden, we found out that we were being sponsored by my uncle here in Michigan, who never experienced the war, with, through a church, Millbrook Christian Reformed Church. And, um, and then all these incredible individuals within the church um, sponsored us and, and did the paperwork and they, and, and they intentionally processed it so that we would be here by Christmas Day. So we arrived Christmas Eve 1980 from this tropical squalid refugee camp one moment later, we are in the heart of Michigan winter in this white, white community. <laughs> we were one of two Asian families in 1980. And um, so, so the you can culture imagine culture shock, shock, climate, culture shock, every type of shock right. at every level. <laughs> And then you have to go to school. What was your English capability at the Zero. time? Zero. And yet you're the next, within a frame, of mo a frame of time, you start school. And then we started school in January. And, but you know, for us, it was, uh, of course, you know, the children, um, we, we, uh, we, we had a schedule, we, we, um, we had school, but it was more difficult for the adults. It was more difficult for my aunts and uncles because they were of an age where they had to learn a job and, and, and make a living despite the incredible financial support and emotional support of the church, of this community. But they were of that age where, and um, so you can imagine, here we are as refugees broken, having survivor and survivors of a genocide, starting anew in a completely different land, in a completely different culture with snow. We've never seen snow before. We've never seen people with white hair before, with blue eyes before. So it was, um, you know, of course, you know, I'm, I'm speaking and with, I mean, it's amusing in hindsight. But, but it, was it was difficult. It was difficult. So ultimately you succeed in school and you uh, go to Georgetown and then you go to the University of Michigan for law school. And now you're in human rights work. How does you go from your experience to deciding to go back and live in Cambodia? It was a very easy decision. My history informed where I am now in terms of human rights. Um, I am a Christian and of course I'm, I'm very much burdened by the fact that to whom much is given, much is expected and I'm very, very greatly blessed. Um, 
Um, but I've said, I, I, I mean, I'm making it sound like it's a burden. It's not. What I, I love what I do now. I can't pretend that I'm a local Cambodian. I, tr um, you know, I, I hold two passports. I hold a Cambodian passport. I hold a U.S. passport. Your freedoms are greater. Uh, my, my freedom is, is so much greater. And, and the skills, the, um, the, the upbringing, the the love, education, the, 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 the support system I have, it's, it's. It's incomprehensible to a local Cambodian, and so um, so it was, it was a very natural um, progression, uh, informed by my history, by the opportunities given me, and um, and you know I mean Cambodia is it's 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 difficult emotionally for me to be there, but it has all the comforts and the resources for individuals like us to make a home there. Um, what is difficult is up here in the mind, seeing the extreme poverty and, and the extreme wealth, the chasm between um, and, and the divide between um, the, the small elite um, wealthy population and the sea of poverty of an extreme level. So when in the 75 to 79 when the Khmer Rouge is wiping out mm -hmm. um, the educated, the intellectuals, the teachers, the doctors, the lawyers, how has Cambodia recovered from the wiping out of that generation? We're still recovering. We haven't recovered. We um, and uh, for for me, I would like to see the recovering process um, go a little bit faster. But you know, when when the um, when Vietnam ended the Khmer Rouge regime and, and took over Cambodia in 1979, they couldn't even find five lawyers in the whole country, five individuals with a law degree. They couldn't even find meaning that you had no judges, you you had no lawyers. You had um, the teachers, uh, um, the, the Khmer Rouge successfully obliterated the educated class, their targets. And so in 79, we had to build a country from survivors and from survivors without education. And traumatized survivors. And traumatized survivors. Right. So the democracy in your court system now still, in your opinion, would say is emerging, is evolving? Um, it's emerging, it's, be, it's being developed, but um, again, very burdened by its history. Uh, Cambodia only opened up and was, uh, was only exposed to democracy when the United Nations went into the country in 1992. You know, Cambodians up until now, we have not been citizens. We have been, uh, first of all, we have been subjects because we lived in a monarchy. And then the Khmer Rouge made us survivors. So we've been subjects and we have been survivors. We've, we are only recently learning how to be a citizen, meaning learning what it means to have rights, rights and responsibilities. The human rights community is very, very effective in disseminating the rights, but we still don't understand in real terms. We hear it, it's theoretical yet. Um, how do we implement and own that, th those rights as, as citizens now, as Cambodians? And more than that, um, I mean, citizens, we not only have rights, we also have responsibility. So for me, that is, I think, the next stage is to, um, to balance the rights that we have as citizens and as new citizens, as Cambodians, with responsibility. And so what I think that's a What would that look like? What would the it, the what focus would on civic education. You know, Cambodians, we don't even have the, um, the word for civic. I mean, of course, we have a word for citizen, but, but there's that, that nuanced understanding of what is civic responsibility, so civic involvement. education, involvement, participation in real terms rather than going through the process. What does it mean to own these rights? And of course, in the human rights community up until now as well, um, has been focusing on the adult population and disseminating the rights. But I wanted to go further because if we want to change mentality, and if we want to change bad habits into more progressive, more um, admirable ones, we need to start young. If we want to say, don't throw cr and, and trash on the ground, we don't go and teach an adult that. We start young and, and you know, with elementary students. So, so this is where uh, my focus is now with, with regards to civic education. So the citizens need to understand their history in a context that is actually part of the justice process yeah. that is going on right now in yeah. Cambodia, isn't it? Yeah. It's shaping the self-image of Cambodians, not victims, but people who can embrace justice. And that means bringing these existing Khmer Rouge individuals uh, into court, doesn't it? I see the Khmer Rouge tribunal um, as a catalyst, as um, an opportunity, 
and it's a window of opportunity because we won't have this again. The, is that because they're dying? I mean, the age of these uh, and people? And we won't have a trial. I mean, and it's, it's now we have a mixed international tribunal of um, UN um, officials right. and personnel working with the Cambodian um, court officials to try the senior Khmer Rouge leaders. And as you said, they're old, they're dying. If we don't have them, we're not, we don't have anyone to try. And plus, there's already a, 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 a natural limitation to how long a trial process can go on. So there is is, we're given a great opportunity in the Khmer Rouge Tribunal to use it as a catalyst, this court system, this court process, to use it as a catalyst to jumpstart conversations long overdue. And so um, it's really important that we in the human rights community be creative and, uh, and, and use this code of law to jumpstart conversations and to create and, multi and multiply benefits in the court of public opinion. And we're trying to do that through film, through discussions, through public forums, by, um, produce, um, by taking the, the materials and the documents being produced at the Khmer Rouge Tribunal and well, then translating fact, it into uh, the vernacular language for the larger population to understand. Because as you know, I mean, you are, you are a lawyer as well. I mean, I mean, um, the, le the legal, legal language is so arcane and archaic. How many people understand legalese, even for in the best educated of us, besides lawyers and judges, the rest of any population has um, have a very difficult time understand the legal language of any court system, modern, developed, or or um, fragile as, as Cambodia. In fact, you're the subject of a documentary that's helping educate your population. I am. This documentary film called Facing Genocide, produced um, by a very established um, uh, film company in Sweden, was nominated um, for best documentary at the um, Rome International Film Festival, um, and also. So the Khmer Rouge Tribunal is, um, is unique in that it opens up um, the opportunity for victims, for survivors, to become a direct party in the criminal proceeding. And I was the very first one to um, be accepted and recognized as a civil party in international law. Yes. Um, so in addition to my professional work, which is the engagement of the Cambodian population with regards to human rights and democracy, and now what is happening at the Khmer Rouge Tribunal, there is a very particular personal interest in this, and I'm combining and, and trying to use use my personal interest and, and um, involvement to um, shape the larger discussion just because I'm, I am given a little bit of a public platform. Um, so let's watch the documentary. Yeah. What takes place in the mind of a man standing accused of the systematic murder of his own people? Is it possible to approach him to understand the choices he made? We are the victims of the democratic Cambodia regime. We are pleased to see some justice for Cambodians who were victimized between 1975 and 1979. My responsibility is personal. I don't have any power. Maybe. We knew that something horrible had happened at night, that night and something did happen. My mom was killed that night along with the other prisoners. So you, in this film, um, we actually see one of the leaders of the Khmer Rouge, who's now being brought to trial, and his wife. He's the former head of state. He was the public face of the Khmer Rouge regime. He's denying responsibility. He's denying responsibility, which is 
it's ludicrous because he is not just a director of one prison. He was the head of state of the Khmer Rouge regime, yes. recognized by China, recognized by the world. He traveled the world during the four years. And we are supposed to believe that he didn't know anything about the law, the law, the, the executions of two million Cambodians. So the truth is very important during this trial, isn't it? So the, in the face of denial, um, having a trial that says, no, your denial is mm. not the truth. This is the truth. The search for truth is integral to justice. Justice requires truth. We cannot have justice without the process of truth seeking. And the trial allows, uh, the, um, is one of the um, better means to truth seeking, to getting information. Um, it's not the only means, um, but it's a necessary means. So this is why we believe in the Khmer Rouge Tribunal as a court of law, but it's um, not sufficient. We need to look at other mechanisms as well in terms of dialogue and um, memorializing. And, you know, we don't have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in, in Cambodia, like the South African um, uh, model. Um, but what I see as our dialogues in the, in the provinces, I see um, that as an informal mechanism of truth and reconciliation. And justice is, is our demand. Justice is more than legal justice. Mm. It requires the search for truth. And um, that is what, uh, what the Cambodian people want. Thank you. My guest today has been Tiri Sang, author of Daughter of the Killing Fields, about her experiences in Cambodia during the Khmer Rouge genocide. I'm Shirley Hoekstra, and thank you for watching Inner Compass.